Uh, via telephone, uh, the Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr joins us. Eric, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Excellent, thank you. What do you think about the the name Basil? Would you consider that one for a dog or Basilica, Eric, along the way? Was it Basil? Is that what you said? Basil. B A like Basil <laughs> Rathbone, kind of B A S I L. Basil Rathbone. Uh, I guess if that's if that floats your boat, it's good for me. Yeah. <laughs> my my neighbor's a nurse, and she named her dog Florence Nightingale. That's great. Florence Nightingale. Yeah, because she's great. a nurse. Uh, we and, are just about, called it what? Called it what? I think Flo? just call her Flo. Hey, Florence Nightingale, Flo? come for dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah Flo, just call her Flo or Florence, yeah. Uh, Eric, we're about to uh, wrap up the end of the fiscal year here in a couple of days, correct? Uh, we are, yeah. We're getting really close to it here at the end of June. Uh, do you have any idea about the June projections at this time and what you figure to end the year with surplus-wise? We're probably going to be a total of around $1.8 billion. Um, we'll probably fin finish up with about um, – Somewhere neighborhood of five hundred million coming in in June, which is all surplus at this point. Wow! Excuse me. Yeah, you're you're, you're excused. No problem there. Uh, at, at the beginning of the year, what were your projections for this year's surplus? Do you recall? Yeah, we had um, uh, projections were around one point seven billion is about what we anticipated getting in. Um, got about about another hundred million on that. We actually appropriated about one point one billion in the, when we set the budget up. Uh, for this past year, for out of the fiscal 23 revenues. What are you projecting for next year, obviously taking into account the fact that the state income tax will trim off some of that uh, surplus that you had this year? You know, we're still probably going to be in, in the neighborhood of around a billion dollars in surplus uh, for next year, and it may be more than that because even, even with the income tax cut, we're still seeing a climb in income tax collections. And that's been due to uh, just the economic growth. You know, West Virginia has, has seen the uh, – excuse me, guys. My allergies have got me, got me bad this morning. That's okay. Yeah. Um, the um, um, economic growth in West Virginia has produced uh, just the improved payrolls coming in. So uh, West Virginia is right now the, the fourth large, fastest-growing GDP in the country. Um, and, and we have among the, the highest surpluses as a percentage of our budget for this past year in the country as well. So uh, even though we went in and did an income tax cut and did the tax credits back for uh, equipment and vehicles um, and some other things there, we're still seeing um, some revenue improvement coming in. So I think as we go through, we're going to see overall reduction in the surplus side of it, but I think we're still going to be very healthy. Are you anticipating a trigger kicking in to enable another additional 10% perhaps tax cut next year? I, I think it's very likely, yes. Billy. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Senator. Uh, we, during the year, we've heard a lot about funding the front end and funding the back end. The back end will be funded through the surplus. So I assume this year, out of the $1.8 billion, there are several items that you will be funding. Uh, has, have they already been pre-approved, or they have to go, back, go through the legislative process of approval? How does that work? Yeah, the, uh, the front end of the budget and back end of the budget, the way they operate is the front end of the budget is um, your recurring annual expenses. So it, it's stuff that is your operational expense to the state, essentially. The back end of the budget is reserved more for, like, one-time expenses. And one of the things we've done differently to operate over the past few years with holding the four flatline budgets is we did start to put some of the more operational stuff in the back end. And what that did is it pulls it out of your ongoing budget. And it forces efficiencies in those agencies that we can go in and see because when they know that that money is at risk, then they have to be a lot more judicious with how they're going to use that money and what they have left. And so we're able to see how they were to operate. Well, going this past budget that we just passed, we moved those operational expenses. They're truly in the front of the budget now, all except for one. The only one that uh, I think that was an ongoing operational expense would have been uh, tourism. And we had some uh, marketing plan that the governor's office and the Chelsea Ruby had put forth in order to be able to follow through on that. We went ahead and kept um, this, the, the current plan in the back of the budget, which I think was about $7 million um, out of the um, $1.8 billion that we're seeing. So we appropriated $1.1 billion. $400 million of that was, uh, went toward an income tax reserve fund so that if we didn't, um, if we gave too big of an income tax cut that we have a reserve there that we could go in and make up for expenses of the state. It doesn't look like we're going to have to hit that. And then... 
Um, the rest of the things went through deferred maintenance. One-time expenses, primarily, and our focus was is that we did a one-time expense on things that would either re- prevent us from having to spend tax dollars later or produce increased revenues for the state later on. For instance, some economic development activities we know will help generate revenue for the state going forward, which helps us keep from having to raise taxes. We did about $220 million toward deferred maintenance, which would reduce a, um, increased damage that could have happened to some of our buildings and our parking garages and all those type of things we had not taken care of, which would have required more money. So that's been the philosophy of that, that back of the budget. And we did that with $1.1 billion of it. We have about another $700 million coming in. And that $700 million is pretty much committed at this point. Um, we have to uh, – uh, the very first thing that comes out of that uh, extra uh, $700 million that we've not appropriated yet is rainy day fund contribution. And that's going to be in the neighborhood of $200, $220 million. just depends on how the market does. Um, we still have to do more deferred maintenance. Uh, there's about another $220 million that goes into uh, – to getting all the deferred maintenance caught up for the state that would round it out. We still have to do the employer contribution for PIA for doing the PIA correction, and that's probably about $150 million. And then we've been doing, uh, past several years, you know, we've been putting more and more roads from the general revenue, or funds from the general revenue into our roads, uh, in our secondary roads. If, uh, prior to, uh, prior to the, us starting this, I think it was two years ago, the most it ever had came out of into you know, appropriation out of the general fund into your secondary roads was about $20 million. That was a record high. For the past couple of years, we put $150 million into um, secondary roads. And so coming up here in August and maybe a special session afterwards, we're probably going to take a look again at secondary roads and see if we can put about another $150 million into those as well because the um, Department of Highways has been doing pretty well to turn that into asphalt. So, um, and that's that pretty much eats up at the rest of your um, the 700 million that comes in. So, I think it, it's not spoken for because it's not been appropriated. But I expect that um, those are probably where the appropriations will go. And like I say, rainy day, we have no choice in that one. That's that statutory um, obligation on the that. And then PIA is also going to be a statutory obligation. So right there, you've got at least 350 million of the of that 700 accounted for. Senator, two areas you did not mention, uh, one of which we've been hearing a lot about over the last uh, uh, several months is corrections and going to require dollars to uh, for that. And the other one are the schools, uh, the secondary, uh, the, uh, uh, the college and universities. Uh, there's a, uh, a lot of uh, pushback from the university presidents that they are being underfunded. Uh, would you address those two items, please? I'll be happy to. Uh, the Department of Corrections is not a surplus item. Uh, Department of Corrections issues has more to do with an ongoing expense. Um, and what's happened there is that we have about 1,100 um, people that are – we have about 1,100 open positions within Department of Corrections. So there are, there are full-time employee positions that are not filled. And, and the way that the governor has been uh, addressing that has been putting National Guard um, – Western National Guard into the Department of Corrections. I think there's about I think 700 of those guys in there right now. And that's been about $17 million a year that we've been paying out to the Guard to cover those positions. Um, the Department of Corrections, when they came into this past uh, session's finance budget hearing, they said it'd take about $10,000 a raise across the board at that time to get their FTEs filled and uh, the legislature, and especially leadership in the legislature, I know we're, we're having these discussions now, feels that you know just throwing money at the problem is not going to fix it. Um, there's process issues within corrections that, that we are going to require be addressed so that these positions are, one, that you're attracting people that you can retain, um, and that there's career-level positions and career-level promotions that can happen within that system so that we don't have such a churn within Department of Corrections. Another thing is, is the deferred maintenance side of it. You know, there's the, the jails have got into a terribly dilapidated structure across the state, um, which is a big part of that total of the $440 million that uh, we're looking at in um, deferred maintenance, which is – that's about uh, $200 million of it. The um, process side of it for corrections is we're looking at, you know, it's how many days in jail – are required for going. It's not how many, it's not people. We all want safe communities. Department of Corrections are absolutely required. We want safe and jails that keep our communities also safe. 
And so to do that, um, we're looking at is, is the people that are in there, how long are they in there and what are they in there for? And we found, you know, that 51% of the people in our jails are pre-trial. So if, if 51% are pre-trial, are they in there for jailable offenses? Or are they in there for fine offenses and they're just waiting to, to get their first hearing? Well, we're finding that that's the case. So there's, uh, we're looking at process across the board, all the way from judiciary to within, um, uh, within corrections itself, to see if all the days that are spent in jail are required to be spent in jail, um, and for the, making sure that we have room for the people that need to be in there for however long they need to be in there, that we got a spot for them. And so that's, um, that's what we're looking at right now. We're making good headway there with discussions within leadership. Um, I think that the initial ask that they came in um, for, oh, and, you know, you guys up in Eastern Panhandle, locality pays a big discussion that as well, is that, you know, if you uh, might go and give raises across the board, still not touch an area's um, salary market, um, which especially when you're up close to D.C. market up there, you guys have uh, higher salary requirements. So locality pays us is something else we're looking at. So if that's the case, does it really require $28 million in salaries to get us there? And so we're not sure that it does. Um, so we're looking at if we go and address processes and we look at locality pay, what is required on the spend, because that spend is going to be perpetual. And not only is it salary, it's also the benefits and everything that come along with state employees. And we need it to be sustainable. We don't want to hear coming in next year that, you know, well, last year it was a $10,000 and this year, it's another $10,000, and we promise that's going to fix corrections. So um, we're not going to throw money at it. We're going to make sure that the, the money is used efficiently and effectively, and we end up with safe jails and safe communities out of it. So um, that's, that's what we're looking at on the corrections side of it. But that don't, I don't anticipate that being a surplus item. I anticipate that to be in base budget. Um, education, I can go into that, or if you've got questions on that one, I can, I can address those on corrections. Good, Maria. Uh, quick question, Senator. You alluded to locality pay, which is something that our local delegation and really the community at large has been talking about for, oh gosh, I don't know, 20, 30 years maybe. Um, I'm probably exaggerating a little bit there. Um, our local delegates and senators say they came very close to the finish line, could not push it over. Um, is there a recognized uh, among the rest of the the state's uh, legislators a recognized um, piece that that this is this really needs to go or is that um, is that ever going to come to pass? I guess that's what I'm asking. Well, I can tell you, President Blair has been a huge advocate for getting locality pay, and he's he's defined the problem really well for us um, here lately when we've been having these these discussions. So amongst leadership and with the Department of Corrections, I think that there's consensus that locality pay has to be addressed. Um, I don't know that it requires a statutory change in order to be able to address it. In fact, I don't think it does. Um, if uh, you know, corrections could go in, if they've got a shortage in the eastern panhandle as compared to what they might have, um, say, in Boone County, um, and the market salary is different there, I think it's completely within their, their statutory leeway at this point to be able to to implement um, a, a locality pay. So, yeah, those discussions have been in there. I think that uh, we're, as, at least as a leadership team and within the um, Department of Corrections, we're getting to a spot to where it looks like locality is going to be included with it. Um, I, I think they can get there as long as they have the revenue to do it, and we're, you know, we'll help assist with getting that revenue there as long as we see the processes are correct. Now, that's, I think, what we'll come back to with our caucuses at some point. Um, to go for that. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's more likely than not is what I'm seeing. Can we, uh, let's go back to the, uh, uh, the funding uh, for the, the schools, the college and universities, if you will, Senator. Yeah. So the college and universities, there's, um, um, we provide for W, for instance, the state um, taxpayers contribute about 10% of their, their budget. So they, they've got about um, um, I think it's a $1.2 billion budget, and we put about $125 million in it um, is about what it goes. Over the years, it's not been customary to have uh, Marshall University or Western University, which get the lion's share of the higher education funding, 
to have them come in and do individual budget hearings. What's happened is, is we've had the Higher Education Policy Commission come in and go into a budget hearing, and we'll review the money that goes into higher ed in, in the span of 15 to 30 minutes for all the state universities. Um, two years ago, uh, I changed that in, in the finance chair position, and I had uh, the university president for WU and for Marshall, and their CFOs come in and do individual budget presentations for their universities. And it was pretty eye-opening what they brought to us. One of the things that they brought to us, they said there's a declining enrollment. And this is a couple years ago across the country that I think everybody's very aware of now uh, for higher education. There's less people going in for four-year degrees. Um, and the schools across the country have got bloated on a bunch of uh, you know, pursuing the liberal arts degrees especially that really aren't putting people back into the workforce. And as a result, people are not seeing the value in that higher education. Um, so, you know, there's now you know, there's a lot more drive towards skilled trades. So across the country, you've seen this de decreased enrollment. With decreased enrollment, you have decreased revenues coming off those students, whether they're paying tuition, room and board for the books, food, whatever the revenue source they bring to the universities. So this isn't a one-year problem. This is, this is something that's been coming up for a while, and I believe in one of the budget hearings, um, both uh, Brad Smith at Marshall and Gordon Gee from uh, WVU said that they anticipated there to be a significant um, closures of schools across the country, uh, especially the smaller schools that, that can't adapt to the change just fast enough. And I believe that's true. I don't think it's upon it's incumbent upon the taxpayers of West Virginia to carry the sole bill for that decreased enrollment when the universities can make changes actively within their systems to create efficient and effective higher edu institutions of it for education or high edu higher education institutions. So, and, and the university presidents are telling us that, that to us as well. So in those budget hearings, Gordon Gee and Brad Smith both said, look, you know, we, we have changes we need to make within our schools and uh, not just doing what we've been doing because we've been doing it make these changes to, to, to adapt to this new economy for higher education. Uh, I know that uh, they came back this year with plans to do that in their budget hearing for both of them, and I think they're going to be fine. I really do. They're going to go back in. They're going to make uh, some really tough decisions within these schools because change is tough anytime you have to do it. But the higher education economy uh, for these institutions has changed dramatically, and they're going to have to adapt. Ask a process question. You uh, you keep coming back to Shepherd and WVU, uh, WVU and Marshall. Uh, what about the other uh, four-year schools in the state? Are they getting FaceTime with the uh, uh, with the policy ma policymakers, or is it most oh, of FaceTime just being with those two schools? The the rest of the schools, as far as a budget hearing process. So when when we have our legislative session for those sixty days. We have about the first week to two weeks of budget hearings. We line up every state agency, well, not every, the majority of the state agencies that come through and constitutional officers that come in and, and explain to us what they anticipate their need to be to, to fund their services to the state. And when they do that, we go through based on and look at the governor's recommended budget relative to what they're telling us they need, and then the legislature passes legislation that affects those budgets as well, and then we decide based on the information they've given us, um, also recommendations from the governor's office on the budget, and then the legislation we pass, what, how we're going to fund it. So uh, we've got a lot of schools, as you know, um, and it's we're not able to get to every single person that's, or every single entity that spends a tax dollar with those budget hearings. We do it, but we do the majority of them. So what we do for the smaller four-year institutions is Higher Education Policy Commission still does a budget presentation. And that's who goes through, and the money kind of flows through them to these schools. So um, we've also put in a higher education funding formula. The rules are coming out for this, this coming uh, budget year that follow the statute that we passed. And that higher education funding formula, which is a first for the state of West Virginia, um, is – is predicated on results that the universities produce. In other words, here, here's what West Virginia needs from a graduate from our higher education institutions. Is your higher education institution meeting that? How do we weight that performance? And then that's applied to a dollar for a you know, piece of the pie that's committed to higher education. 
I do expect you know, there's going to be schools that aren't going to make it. And, and the reason I think there's schools that aren't going to make it because I think some of these smaller schools are seeing tremendous reductions in enrollment. And, you know, I mean, we're going to be heating and cooling empty rooms um, if they don't find out a way to either to attract students or to adapt to that decreased enrollment. And so if there's not going to be enough enrollment to justify a school being open, I think you'll see closures. And that's not just going to be in West Virginia. That's going to be across the country. Does West Virginia University and Marshall fall under the same higher education funding formula as the other schools? Or they are they, they all funded? they all have the same funding formula. Okay, yeah, so they, they all have the same funding formula. Okay, then I I come back to the question is if they're all under the uh, same funding formula, why does WVU and Marshall have special space time when the other schools do not? I would think higher it's education. It's the size of their budget. Okay. Uh, so their W and Marshall have a much larger appropriation. I don't have those numbers right at the top of my head. Um, except for you know, the views, I think it comes up to around 125 million. If I think uh, Marshall's might have been around 75, it could have been between 50 and 75. I have a hard time bringing that number up. Um, but those, they by far, they have the largest state appropriations historically, individually. And then when you start looking at the rest of higher ed, the rest of higher ed's probably the other less than 50% of it. So Higher Education Policy Commission. Um, Chancellor comes in, uh, Chancellor Sarah Tucker comes in and goes through that with us on both the two-year and four-year institutions from across the state. Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr, our guest here on the program as we get ready to uh, wrap this up and wind it down. Senator Tarr, you mentioned having to kick some money into the rainy day fund. Is that because of investment losses plus the growth of the budget and meeting the correct percentages for the bond ratings? That's exactly what it is. You know, so we've had... Um, um, everybody's well aware of decreased performance in the market, and we have about a billion dollar rainy day fund. And we have a statute that requires that we keep that, that rainy day fund at 20% of the previous fiscal year's expenditures. So, whatever we appropriate, we're going to put 20% of that. Has to, our rainy day fund has to be at least up to 20% of that. It's going to require around uh, neighborhood of $200 million to $220 this year, depending on market performance relative to the appropriations we've made. So. And in regards to the unfilled positions in corrections and other departments in the state, DHHR and such, what happens to the salary that had been budgeted for those positions after the budget year expires and those positions have not been filled? So they have uh, the budget that go the budget goes through that is still there. And what will happen is, is we budget for a certain amount of full-time employees to staff uh, any state agency. And that that payroll expense goes in and they receive it irrespective of whether the position's filled or not. So it's a, uh, um, and that's how seeing some of the state agencies, and it's one of the things we've been really trying to get our, our hands around is, is what is the real FTE deficit? And not just in corrections, but in, in a lot of the state agencies, because if you go in and say a state agency says, well, we have a, require a thousand FTEs and that's what we've had for the past 15 years. Well, for the past 15 years, you've been funded at 300 FTEs. So why do you need the other 700? Where's that money going? And so what's happened is, is, is they've been shifting those funds to cover other expenses. And one of the things we've really been trying to get our hands around um, in the past uh, at least five years and maybe more is going in through that budget and saying, okay, relative to, your whatever your your labor shortfall is um how much do you really need versus what we're appropriating for a payroll because if you know if you need the money fine we'll appropriate it directly to what it's needed for but i want to i don't want to call it all payroll if it's not payroll because then we don't really know how we're spending it so we've been um uh, department by department going in uh, for the past few years and um, certainly under uh, Craig Blair's leadership, it's been a fairly aggressive relative to what it's been, I think, in previous decades to get a handle on that. And that's one of the things we're looking at with corrections. So is it possible that departments are spending money for the sake of spending it so they don't lose it? You know, um, I think that sometimes it's squirreled away more than spending for the sake of spending because there's different things that happen when you appropriate revenue. Not, not, not every appropriation comes back to the general revenue fund if it's not used. And so there's a lot of lines within these agencies' budgets that's considered it's reappropriated. 
In other words, so if, um, if they don't spend it, then it starts building up in the account. And so we we went through and also looked at a lot of that to see okay well if we got you know a large reappropriation happening there, then um, is the money needed there and why are they not having to spend it if they told us they needed it this past session? So um, it's it's kind of a, a um, I hate to say a gamble but really is a gamble for the agency there. So well if we if we don't spend that money and they and then the legislature starts seeing this account build, they're going to think we don't need it. Well if they're if the account's building, they probably don't. And the other side of it is, as well, if we don't if we don't let it build up in the account, what happens if we do need it? So and then, like, you know, there's no guarantee legislature's going to come in and appropriate more money to it. And that's part of the the cat and mouse game, I would say, that happens looking at it from the finance chair position when you're looking at the just the overall bureaucracy of the state is when you pay for when the taxpayer is paying for the services of government. At, we as legislators. Go up there, and or you're charged to, to as much as possible, um, be a fiduciary, uh, res- responsible entity for that taxpayer dollar. And in order to do that, we have to know that that dollar is going toward what we intended it to go to when we appropriated it. And within within the bureaucracy as a whole, you know their their perspective may be that well we want to make sure that we're doing it relative to our mission as a opposed to an individual policy effort and that creates these reserves that happen in these accounts and it also creates an overspend at times for fear that they may not get that same appropriation next year um, I think that's probably been going on since the country was founded and the tax dollar was spent for government um, so it, it's a constant game year to year Senator Tarr thanks so much for your time this morning as always great stuff and much appreciated oh yeah thanks for having me on thank you thanks, Senator.